Okay, today is the 30th of Av, which is Rosh Chodesh El, um, and it's the yard site of Rav Zemlin Kim and Goldberg. So I want to take the opportunity to speak a little bit about Rav Zemlin Kim and Goldberg. When he was 17, there was a Mifsa. Who knows a Mifsa is a Mifsa? I think the Israelis call it Mifsa when there's like some sort of uh, attack. But, um, it wasn't an attack, it was in Panovich, although sometimes in Panovich there are attacks. Am I correct? Um, campaign. The, campaign, yeah, campaign. Um, no, there was a uh, Mifsa, there was a um, a contest in Panovich Yeshiva. Whoever could finish a Shas Babli in one year. And nobody did it, except for Zemna Kemi Goldberg, who was 17. He just didn't finish Babli, he finished Yashami as well. The Rav Shach used to call him the walking Rambam. He had like all the Rambam on his fingertips. And I remember once asking him a certain question, actually had to do with um, kissing your sister. And the Rambam writes that whoever um, is not careful in the gear of Krovim, it's Meshukat, it's Matuav. He used a whole list of adjectives. And he told me, the more adjectives the Rambam used, the more Matur it is. Because if it was really us, you wouldn't have to use all those adjectives. Anyway, he really had a, I found it afterwards that one of the Kadmonim says such an idea. But he really had a shlita in Kola Torah Kulo, and that was, of course, extremely impressive. But the things that uh, most impressed me about Rav and Goldberg, the things, number one was that he was completely apolitical. Right? He didn't like care at all about politics. Once I think it was Wednesday. He used to go to, um, I think, uh, Karen Biyavna and some other Hezder Yeshivas, and he spoke, um, he spoke everywhere. He was connected with everybody. Like, he, he wasn't Goris, the concept of the politics at all. Of course, since he wasn't um, Goris, the concept of the po- politics, so some people didn't accept that because, um, you know, you have to be somewhat political. But for him, it didn't matter at all. That was one thing. And that was what they said about Rebbe Khanan Spector. You know, when my son, we named him Yitzhak Khanan um, because I was, of all the G'daylum, I was incredibly impressed by Ritzel Khanan that he was, everybody held that was in their camp, like a, and nobody could figure out really where he was. And that's really a true manic Yisrael because you know, a lot of times in Levi, as you see, like either all black hats or all white kippahs or all chasidish, or, you know. Urshlovel Zaman and by Rev um, Avad Yosef was everybody was there, you know, because they, and Rosanna Lechemi Goldberg was an interesting Levi because during Corona, right? And the police kept, kept, kept coming to try to stop it. It was also, though, which the Feinstein was also like that. But, you know, there was a lot, a lot of groups there. It was quite uh, clear from a person's Levi, you could really understand what his world outlook is. That was one thing. Another thing that was quite incredible about Rosanna Henry Goldberg was his humility, right? Anava. Until when he was like in his 80s, he was still taking the bus. And it wasn't because he wanted to save money you know, on a driver or cars. There were plenty of people who wanted to drive him. He said, like, why should I be different than anybody else? Like, he really didn't perceive that he was any other, any different than really a Pashtriyat, which um, is very, uh, um, is something quite unbelievable. He wasn't, he wasn't um, Garz himself at all as somebody who deserves any special attention or anything, anything like that. And he, in addition to that, it was just his personality. You know, when, whenever I walked down Rechov Bar Ilan and I passed by Rechov Chana, that well, it's hard to pass by now because there's so much work going on. But you have that road going down to um, to where he used to live, in Rechov El Khan, actually, now Khan it's in Khan. And like I always like think about him and think about like what an incredible loss it was to Klai Israel. You asked him any question in Kolo Kulo, and he would answer you, and he would answer you like with such kavod and with such simplicity and with such clarity, um, and it's really something which we don't have something like that today. You know, that I don't believe there's anybody in the world who has such a tfisa and tera, and with together with such incredible midas, you know, with such humility. Um, I don't know if you have either one. Uh, exists in the world uh, today, and just feel like it's such such a loss um, to Klai Israel. And you could take Shilas through Zemnechem and Goldberg that nobody else would 
touch them, you know, because nobody had the plates, no one had the shoulders like he had. And just as a person, he was such an incredible person to talk to and just to be around and to understand like how 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 he relate to. I remember one time I came into his house. It was a Friday. It was a Friday afternoon. And I remember I was going to spend Shabbos here in Mishkan Esther. And I, and I, um, I had, was going to give a drasha that night. I was going to ask him about what I was speaking about. And I walked in. He was on the phone to Haifa. There was a shayla about uh, a, a girl who got engaged and they found out afterwards she was uh, stuki. Mom's there, uh, Mom's and he said, oh, Rabbi Chavez is here. You could ask him this question. You know, he wrote a sefer on Balai Tshuva, and he hands me the phone. <laughs> anyway, afterwards, he spent three hours with me, and he showed me, like, how I really knew the answer, you know, by giving me all the Mamakamas, of course. But um, it was quite incredible to be around such a person, a person who was so great in Torah and so humble and such such covets, such covet for people, you know, and you, um, the Gemara and Shabbos says, we're going to come to a time in the Jewish people where, where Mishnah Baruch Allah Baruch, there won't be Mishnah Baruch Allah Baruch Bechad. It won't, it just won't be. There won't be clarity. There won't, even the simple, simple Allahs won't be clear anymore. You know, you look in the Svarim today and you have, everything is a machlokas and this one says this and this one says that and, you know, and this, this, all these different sheets, like no one actually knows what to do. I remember he told me once, he said, you learn the shach, you learn the taz, you learn the biscuit shuba, and you machria, you know. Um, but he just had such clarity in everything. And um, I feel that as we're doing our campaign today, it's an obligation on Klal Yisrael, on Jews, on Talmud Yechachamim, on young Talmud Yechachamim, to strive for, to, for greatness. To, you know, maybe we won't Probably we won't get to the level of Zalm Zal, Nechem and Goldberg. But I'll just tell you one thing. When you're around people like that, it gives you shi'ifas. One of the biggest problems we have in the world today is that the mind, people have become so small-minded that they don't have a shi'ifa for greatness anymore. You know? When you're around people like Rav Nechem and Goldberg, Rav, Rav Moshe Sternbach, um, Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach, um, Rav, Sh- Rav Shlomo Safrani, uh, you know, great individuals like that, and you see how great a person can come in Torah. You know, um, Ravavad Yosef, you know, his parents were very simple people. You know, when, you know, when he was younger, the family was very poor. They put him in the Makolets to run the Makolet. Anyway, the next, uh, next morning, the Rashiva of Parad Yosef, who was it? Ravatia. Ravatia. He came and he said, you know, I'm going to run the Makolet. And you send Avadia to learn the Yeshiva. Right? You know, but he was a he was a parent. He was a child of a Bama Kolet. You know, we shouldn't think that God's Torah only comes from people who are from like these really really Chashva families. You know, Rav Chaim Kenievsky, his parent, his father was uh, was um, you know a stipler, and his mother was uh, the sister of the Chazanish. We shouldn't think like that. We should realize that even today, a person who really really has a Sheifa for Godless, he can achieve. He can really achieve greatness. I remember one time we made a perm suitor for the Kolo. I was a little bit drunk, it's true. But six uh, guys walked in from a Baal Tshuva Yeshiva. And I asked them, I said, you know, why can't you become the good Oli Ador? Right? And in fact, I once asked Rav Noah Weinberg, I said, what's your great success in Kirib? Like, how do you do it? He says, I see every guy with long hair and earrings as the next guy to Ador. You know? So I told them, he said, the only reason that... Um, you might not become the God of the because you don't think you can get there, right? But a person really thinks that they can become a Godel, yeah, that's the first step, right? Will you actually get there? It's Siyat HaDishmaya, right? Rav Shlomo Safrani right, once told me, he told me this uh, um, in pa- like in passing, kind of, but in confidence, right? That I wouldn't tell anyone. Big mistake, right? He told me, okay, it's, it's not, it's just, it's, it just brings out his greatness. When he first got married, his in-laws bought him an apartment in Bay Bagan. At the time, I don't know, it was, it was, I don't know, was, I only remember when he was selling it. It was whatever it cost. Anyway, so he moves in the next day, very nice, and the night, at night, they go to sleep, and suddenly he hears banging on the walls and singing, Yai, nai, 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 nai. And it turns out that the people next door had a son who was deranged, and he did that every night for the whole night. He used to bang on the walls and sing that song. And he said, he remembers it very well. Right? 
Anyway, he went through all Yasha, and Ralph says, you know, it's not a, it's not a Mecca Tos, because it's not a problem with the apartment, you know. There's nothing you could do. You can't claim Mecca Tos. Anyway, they lived in that apartment for about 15 years, yeah, 10, 15 years, until they had five or six kids, and then they, they oh, so then, okay, remember he said, one time a Shver came, and like in the middle, he heard this, thing. he said, what's this? He said, yeah, that's, that's what, that's our apartment. Anyway, but he just accepted it with a complete ava. He didn't make, he didn't go back to the sellers, even though Alpi didn't, you know, there, there's, there's no Taina, but it, certainly it's a, it's a little bit of a Pagam and Yashus. He told me once, Agav, I told this someone today. He said, I asked Rav Safrani once, how do you know somebody's greatness? He said, Pepinimius you know from his sneers and Bichitzonis you know from his money. That's the way he deals with money. Anyway, so then he told me after 15 years, they had, they had five kids. It was a two-bedroom apartment. They had to move. And they said, what are we going to do? You know? He said, we're, not, we're going to be honest. So at the time, a three-row apartment in Bayavagam was $55,000. You know? A lot of money, right? $55,000 today, maybe you get like a bathroom in Bayavagam. But anyway. No, no. no probably not. What? Without she puts, okay. And that's what the she puts cost if you already have it. Oh, if you have a okay. <laughs> anyway, so they went down five thousand dollars. They went from fifty five to fifty. And some people called up. Like someone came in, he put five thousand dollars on the table, said I'll take the apartment. Anyway, the next week he said, My kids just can't deal with this, you know, this guy singing all night. I mean I guess he was fifteen years older now, but maybe like he was uh, singing more even. Um, anyway, so I'll be in once you pay, you know. Karka and Nick Nebuchadnezzar. That's it. It's a Kenyan. He said, I'm not going to force you to buy the apartment. He gave the money back and that was it. Right? Anyway, the next week they got a phone call and someone bought the apartment. Who was that? Who bought the apartment? Oh, a deaf woman. An 80-year-old deaf woman they needed an apartment for. It was perfect. You know, cheap and she didn't mind saying it. In any event, he told me once, he said, my etzloch in Chosh Mishpah was quite incredible. You know, he's the row of 80 shuls. And the Av based in France, and he's Rosh Hashiva and Rosh Kol, and he's on many Bati Dinim, right? He said it was because of that. Because of that, you know. We were honest, we were Yasher, we were Sovel, it, we, we accepted it with Av Hashem, right? He, ta- he went to, he grew up in Tel Aviv. You know, he grew up in Tel Aviv. He told me once there was a girl who went to school with him. He said, Shloima, I'm also learning Bab Metzina. <laughs> you know? So he went to a school called the Yishuv, the Yishuv uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, there was another big rub there also. I won't say his name, but many big rub on him came out of there, and uh, they came out and they went on. Right, so we shouldn't think that you have to be like from the biggest yechos and you know and the biggest goinim uh, and the biggest balikishon in order to really achieve uh, uh, to become a talmud chacham or a real talmud chacham. Right, um, really, amelus batera is uh, the primary factor. And that was, uh, look at every gadol, Rav, Rav, Rav Avadia, Rav, Rav Shlomo Zaman, Rav, there was a, there was a koilo, right? Rosh Kol told me there was a koil, I think it was called Karen, Karen something. Um, and uh, Rav Avadia was in it, Rav Shlomo Zaman, Rav Yashiv, uh, Rav, uh, Rav ya- Yisrael Yaakov Fisher, maybe there was one more. And Rav Yisrael Yaakov Fisher was the biggest masmid, right? He would dominate, sit down to learn, um, and he wouldn't get up until uh, uh, Minva, uh, uh, Katana. Right? So he would learn basically like 12, 14 hours straight. He said all the, just someone switch, switch the ashtrays, you know, the ashtrays up. But, you know, the <coughs> primary factor of becoming a, a, an Anmagadal is the Smada and Cheshek and the, you know, and the, um, and the male is the person that puts in Tera. And they said, one time, Rav Zalm Nechemi Gober, I heard this from one of the Roshi Kolim that he used to um, give shir by. He said, you know, we changed our tochnit. He said, okay, so tell me what simon, I'll give a shir on that. He could give a shir even on the spot in any simon in Shulchan Aruch. You know, said Yichol Shemeshva. So, um, on the day of his yard site, it's the day of our campaign. And um, really, my she'ifa is, okay, where it's Yeridus Adaris, and but if a person really, really has shifas, and number one, it's really kedai to be around anashim gedolim, because you understand, you know, what happens is that if you don't see these in the, these great gedolim, is that you don't understand what godless is. You, know, you don't understand what godless is, and really, 
the to see it, it's it's a totally different experience, right? What does the Gemara say? If someone saw like Rameer's back when he was davening, and he said, if he would have seen the front, it would have been different, but that made such an incredible impact. I called the guy yesterday in the campaign. I was in Las Vegas for Shabbat Shuvah two years ago, and the guy said, since you left, I'm thinking about you every single day. You know, you made such a on me. And I spoke a few, uh, a little bit of time. We had suitors together. But you never know the shpoa you're going to have on somebody, number one. Um, and if you're around people, right, right, you can learn what does it really mean to be an Alam Gadol and not to copy them, right? You shouldn't copy that, but you could see their kofus and efesh and apply it, apply it to yourself. Someone told me on Shabbos, there was a certain Talmud Chacham, I forgot what it was, but Rabbi Yashvel, Rabbi Yashvel, this, he doesn't copy, right? He takes things and he applies it according to his own personality. And that was his, uh, that was his real godless. Or Shlomo Zaman to Orbach, so Davin a certain minion, right? And the of a, of a gadol, I forget which gadol. And when the gadol was nifter, someone took over and he tried to copy, like, during a important part of Shimon Esri, well, like this or something. So he tried to copy that in Haggis. And he said, or Shlomo Zaman left because he held out with Shek. Right? You don't copy Gedele. You uh, watch their on Haggis and you try to incorporate it into your own personality. Um, so on the yard side of Zelda and Goldberg and it's our campaign, and that's really our shifa. He told me when I started this call, I went to, before I started the call, I went to Rev um, Ruven Leuchter. You know, Ruven Leuchter, you know, Ruven Leuchter. And he, he asked me, why, why do you want to start a kole? Why do you want to start a kole? Because he's, he's Swiss. I said, because I want to give. I want like this. He said, ah, this is your first mistake. He said, you don't give like this. He said, you give like this. Meaning, right, the goal of a mechanic is to appreciate someone else's koichos and direct them. Right? See their godless and direct them. And that was really Rav Zemdech Henry Goldberg. He never told you to do anything. He never gave you musr. He never gave you advice. But just like talking to him, you left his home like feeling so elevated. Let's tell you one story. There was there's someone today who she's married to um, a Rosh Hashiva. I could probably say who it is, but I'm not going to because I'm very hush of uh, this person I feel is one of the five uh, five people in the world, Lashem Shemayim. Someone asked me before she got remarried. I said, if there are five people in the world, Lashem Shemayim, she's one of them. Anyway, I was at her um, uh, bar, uh, bar mitzvah, right? Um, she was divorced. The husband was there as well. There was like 10 people there. 10 people. And it was in where we had my wedding, Wulam Beis Israel. So, you know, my wedding, it was Ben Ismanim. There was maybe... 100 people, 150, 200. But imagine that big hall with 10 people in it. It was like so sad. Anyway, I went down the street to Rosanna Kevin Goldberg to his house. And I um, I said, Rebbe, I said, you know, this, this this woman, you know, she suffered so much. And she's making a bar mitzvah. There are only 10 people there. I said, if the Rav would come, it would like make such a big difference to the Simcha. And, you know, he picked up his frock, he put it on. He said, where are we going? He says, we're going to do a mitzvah. Like, he didn't say, like, yeah, well, you know, like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm very busy. Like, what are you bothering me for? No. He got up, he went, he went in, and he sat down, and he gave a shikol joshua, and he smiled. And, like, it was, like, all, it was Shemayim Aretz. It made such a big difference in this Semcha. And it was just such, such an incredible person, such a sura sa'adam. You know, you really see what, Torah could do to a person, how it can elevate a person to such a such a level of humility and kindness and warmth and giving and clarity and pashtas, you know, all these meters are one person. And then there's the Torah, you know, there's a Torah that he had, which um, which uh, we all need to have such a shifas, right? And Agav, he said, you know, he, said, he told me once, he said, it's really worth it to learn the sugya well. He said, you save a lot of time because then you understand what's going on, you know. So that was really, he really had it really, uh, everything really clear. And it's interesting, it says, I think, a, a small levaya, right? A small levaya is a sign of what? Is, um, I think a small levaya, it's like more, you'll, you're, you'll, from the covered, you might lose a schar, a big levaya, you know? You might lose schar from that. So it was only like 2,000 people as levaya, because it was during corona. And anybody who came, you know, 
they were like basically breaking the law by coming to the Slavia, you know. And there were helicopters flying around and this, and it was it was really like a very interesting, you know, experience. And everyone who came out was really like, you know, fighting the um, the law over here. Uh, but it was like, how can you not come to Rav Zalman Goldberg's Slavia? Like, how can you just how can you miss such a thing? Uh, but um, so even in his even his, in his patira, he, there was pastures, even his, in his uh, patira. So we should be zoiche to uh, to follow in his ways, and especially in the koil, to copy his, not copy his hashem, to emulate his ways of pastures and simcha and clarity and uh, midos tovos and hasmada and bekias and bezrat hashem will be zoiche to um, to to grow in halacha and hora. And whoever hasn't contributed yet to our campaign, there's still time. Uh, you can write to me at dytravis613 at gmail.com, and we will still accept your donations, even though it's so uh, late, um, when the, by the time this year gets up. Um, and um, if you would like me to dive in 40 days through the Kosal, right? And when you ask Rav Zalman Khan to dive in for something, like it was just, it was with all his heart. It was such an incredible uh, experience to be around him. Shem should help us to um, to emulate his holy ways of mankind. Shkoch.